going to jump back into our series on honor. I'm going to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's going to be on the wall behind me. You can follow, uh, follow there or you can turn, to, uh, turn there in your Bible or on your smart device. 1 Thessalonians 5. And I do want to honor our, and welcome our first time guest today as well as those that are viewing online. Thank you for joining us and thank you for being here. What a great day to be in God's house. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 12. And Paul writes, Dear brothers and sisters, honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work and live peaceably with each other. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy, encourage those who are timid, take tender care of those who are weak, and be patient with everyone. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Do not stifle or do not quench the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Amen. Hold on to what is good and stay away from every kind of of evil. Lord, I thank you for the reading of your word today. And Lord, we turn our hearts, our minds, our attention to your word. Holy Spirit, come and have your way. Thank you for being amongst us. Thank you for the amazing time of worship. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you exist among us to glorify Jesus and help us in our pursuit of him. Lord, may this word be a continuation of that pursuit. A continuation of who he is and who he's called us to be and how we can best attain to be that person. Lord, hide me behind your word. Let the presence of God fill this place to overflowing today, I pray. Pray that our hearts have been prepared to hear from you. So Holy Spirit, have your way and speak, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Mario. What an amazing time by our worship band this morning, huh? Great job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So today I'm going to continue the series on honor and speak to you about honoring spiritual leaders. Those men and women who are set in the church to perfect us and equip us for the things that God has called us to do. Honor is defined as to regard or treat someone with, with, with respect and, and admiration. And when you honor someone, you give them special recognition and you show them reverence. So what does the Bible say about honoring those set among us as leaders of the church? Well, I'm going to give you four biblical reasons to honor your spiritual leaders besides the obvious one, which is it's the right thing to do. Remember, we started the series on establishing a culture of honor and, the, and Peter said, we're to honor all men. So honor extends beyond spiritual leaders. And, 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 and next week we're going to talk about honoring those that serve in other capacities. But it's the right thing to do. That's the obvious reason to honor. But I want to give you four other reasons to do so. But before I give you reasons to honor church leaders, let me give you four reasons why some people do not or may not honor the leaders in the church. The first reason is some people do not honor their leaders because they focus 
on a leader's failure to meet their expectations. They focus on a leader's failure to meet their expectations. The second reason, some do not show honor because they let the familiarity of the leader get in the way. Remember what Jesus said, a prophet is without honor except in his own country, among his own people, and in his own house. The third reason why some fail to honor their spiritual leaders is they focus on the leader's weaknesses. Listen, every single one of us who lead in the body of Christ are flawed. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but your pastor is not perfect. Of course, you know that. But if you look at a person's weaknesses and you focus on that, that can cause you to not honor them the way you should. And the fourth reason is some see their leaders as they see everyone else in the church. And therefore give them or do not give them the honor that is due as a leader among God's people. Now, let me tell you, most of you guys who know me know that this is not a comfortable message for me to preach. Because I don't want you to think I'm preaching about me. Okay? Because I feel very honored by you. I feel very loved by you. But this honor and this respect must go beyond the person who's leading. There are many leaders set in among us. And listen, we need to learn how to honor all of them. Every single one of them. In his first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul concluded that letter by giving the church some final advice. He advises them to stay away from evil and hold on to what is good. He said, do not scoff at prophecy, but also test everything. Listen, testing is not dishonoring. It is the right thing to do. So when a prophetic word comes forth, no matter who gives that word, even if it comes from me, it is right for you to test that word. And in doing so, you're not dishonoring in any way because we're instructed to test everything. Paul said, do not quench the Holy Spirit and be thankful in all circumstances. He told them to never stop praying. Be joyful always. Do good to all people and see that no one pays evil for evil. The apostle instructed the church to be patient with everyone, to take tender care of those who are weak, and to encourage those who are timid. He also said, warn those who are lazy. (laughs) Warn those who are lazy and live peaceably with each other. Paul then tells the church to honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. This is actually the first advice he gives. I gave the advice backwards because I wanted to land here. But the first advice he gives them is honor those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. Those who work hard among you and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work. Reason number one, to honor your spiritual leaders. Honor them for their work. Honor them for the work they do. It is the work that leaders in the church do that sets them apart from the rest of the body. 
Now, I don't mean being set apart as to be unreachable or untouchable, but set apart as laborers of Christ working for the good and welfare of others. If you have difficulty honoring your spiritual leaders, if for no other reason, honor them for what they do. It's not the calling. You got to get this. It's not the calling. Remember, Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. It's not the position. People place too much emphasis on positions in the church. And please hear me. All a position is is a platform for you to serve from. So if you're not willing to serve, listen, you should not desire a position. If you're not willing to serve, you should not desire a position because the position is a platform of service. It is not the calling. It is not the position that Paul said we're to honor our leaders. It is for the work that they do. Those set in the church to lead the people of God are to be shown respect, honor, and wholehearted love, not because of who they are, but because of what they do. Have you ever said, I heard someone say, I cannot honor the person, but I respect their position. <laughs> According to Paul, that's bad reasoning. We're told to honor our leaders for the work they do, not the position they hold. And I don't mean just the work of teaching or preaching, but their, but their whole body of work, the other things that are done to serve the body are just as important as this. I'm going to share something with you really, really quick. Uh, and I, shared, I spoke with this young lady to make sure I could do it. Because really, it, to me, it, it makes it, it drives home a point. And it helped me to see a place of service in the church like I've never seen it before. One of a young lady in our church feels called to the mission field. That is her desire to go to the mission field and serve for years serving other people. Her and I met many times about it. I wholeheartedly approved of her going. I was excited for her to have this opportunity. And she was going through FMI, Four Square Mission International. So she went out to California and spent a week out there training and meeting with the leaders and and for them to understand if if she's ready, if she's the right fit for it right now in her life. And at the conclusion, they decided to not allow her to go yet. And this is the main reason. There was no long-standing demonstrated place of service to the church. She's faithful to attend. She's faithful in her giving, but she had not served faithfully in the church. And our leaders decided we cannot send someone to the mission field who have not first proven themselves in the local church. Her pastor bought off on it. Her pastor supported her. I was excited for her to have this opportunity. But when I heard that, I thought, you know, that is right. Because until you have shown the, the willingness to serve and work in the body of Christ, putting you in a place or in a position that, 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 that extends beyond this place is setting you up for failure. So she came back and she's faithfully been serving in this church every Sunday because her desire is to go to the mission field and she want to get that part right. You see, we look too much at positions. We, we, We focus too much on the calling. But Paul said it's the work we do that matters. It is the work. The word honor is used here carries the idea of appreciating a person's true worth. The basic rendering of 1 Thessalonians 5.12 is honor those who labor among us. 
Labor speaks of a godly work that produces goods and services. So spiritual leaders, they work to produce in us what is good and they work to prepare us for service unto the Lord. Paul said in 1 Timothy 5, 17, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and in teaching. In several versions of, of this, this scripture, 1, 1 Timothy 5, 17 says, elders who lead well should be paid double, especially, huh? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Elders who lead well should be paid double, especially those who work with public speaking and teaching. Those who govern and feed the church are to be given double honor of office and salary. This scripture tells us that those who lead well and who preach and teach should be honored above those who serve in other ways. Now, please don't please don't misunderstand me. I'm not petitioning for a pay raise. But I want you to see and hear what the Bible says about how church leaders are to be honored. Yeah. And it is, it is done, double, double, it's a double honor. Pay as well as office. Reason number two to honor spiritual leaders. Spiritual leaders help us grow in godliness. Ephesians 4 gives two primary areas where this growth is to occur. Verse 11 says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And verses 12 and 13 tell us why Jesus set these leaders in the church. They were given for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry and to edify or build up the body of Christ. And this equipping, this edification is to continue, Paul says, until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of Man, Son of God. Jesus set leaders in the church to one, equip the saints for ministry work. And two, perfect the character of the saints. Spiritual leaders are given to equip us to do what Jesus did and to create in us the character and nature of Christ. That's good. Equip, perfect. In his booklet, Desiring God, John Piper writes this about spiritual leadership. Spiritual leadership is knowing where God wants people to go. And it takes the initiative to get them there, using God's methods and relying on God's power. The answer to where people, the answer to where God wants people to be is in a spiritual condition and in a lifestyle that displays his glory and honors his name. Therefore, the ultimate goal of spiritual leadership is that people come to know God and to glorify him in all they do. Spiritual leadership is aimed not so much at the, as directing people as it is at changing people. If we would be the kind of leaders we ought to be, we must make it our aim to develop persons rather than dictate plans. If we would be the kind of leaders we ought to be, we must make it our aim to develop persons rather than dictate plans. You may get people to do what you want them to do, but if there's no change in their heart, you've not led them spiritually. You've just gotten them to do something. You've not taken them to where God wants them to be, the ultimate goal of all spiritual leadership is that others may come to glorify God in their own lives. Yeah. This is a fearful, this is a daunting task that God calls men and women to. It is a task that cannot be accomplished solely by committed leaders. It also takes a commitment from those being led. 
It takes a desire on the people that are being led to grow in ministry and in character. Please hear me. We can prepare well. We can have great communication skills. We can even have the latest and greatest presentation. But our preaching and teaching will be for naught unless those who hear the word of God apply what they hear to their lives. You can't just hear it. You got to become it. You got to become what the word says. Don't just hear. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.21, listen to this. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. Those leaders who loves the Lord and loves his church, considers it an honor to get up before you as often as we can and do what Paul calls a foolish thing. (laughs) Foolish. See, I'm trying to convince you to serve a God who's the best thing that ever happened to you. I'm trying to, yes. We're trying to convince you to live a life that is the best life you can ever live. And Paul said it's foolish. It should not be difficult to honor those who believe it's their God-given responsibility to make us like Jesus. How foolish is that? For me to think, Aaron, that it is my responsibility to make you like Jesus. To equip you to do what Jesus did. Normal people don't think that way. It takes a little foolishness to believe that. Right. Well, I'm just a foolish leader because I believe you can do what Jesus did. I believe you can be like Jesus. I believe you can love like Jesus. I believe you can heal like Jesus. I believe you can raise the dead like Jesus did. And I want you to believe that. Yes. Good. Reason number three to honor spiritual leaders. Spiritual leaders will face a greater judgment. I cannot speak on spiritual leadership and not point this out. James 3, 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, now many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. If you have not been called or chosen, let me use that word, because many are called, but few are chosen. If you have not been chosen by God to teach and preach in the church, please lose that desire. Lose it. Those leaders in the church who teach the word live with great responsibility because of the power of God's word to affect change. The teachers of the word stand in a place of influence and God himself would judge how we use the influence he's given us. God's word in the mouth of the men and women can be a downfall if it's not respected and used for the right reason. It can be a slippery slope because the word has the ability to yield to yield great power over the people who hears it. You know, one of the things my wife and I had to get a hold of real early in our pastoring uh, life was to stay away from those programs and processes where people want you to sign up to, to, to sell something or do something and then you sign other people up. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 
You, you know why they go after pastors? Because of our influence. Because if I they say, well, if pastor doing it, it must be a good thing. I'm going to do it too. And people know that. And listen, many leaders in the church have fallen into that trap. Yeah. And have hurt a lot of people. Yeah. A lot of people have lost respect for the leaders because the leaders influenced them or convinced them to do something that did not end well. Yeah. Right. That's right. I'm going to keep it kingdom. Be listen, listen, because when I keep it kingdom, I know that's going to end well. Yeah. I'm not worried about what the end results are going to be. That's good. We have influence. Yeah. Remember Carnegie? How many of you saw the movie, The Book of Eli? Okay. Wow, several of you have not. You ought to go home and watch it. Now, I'm going to tell you now, if you don't like violence, don't watch it. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of, lot of things happening in the movie. But listen, there's a character in there named Carnegie. And Carnegie is a crime boss who's looking to expand his territory. And he knows that knowledge in the power, uh, uh, knowledge is power in a world where, in, because in that world that the book was, 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 the, the, the book was written in, most people didn't know how to read. Right. So Carnegie, he sent out his gang to go and search the area for books to help him gain control. And there was one book in particular that he, he was desperate to find. Yeah. A book with the power to rally people under his leadership like no other book. And Eli just happened to have the world's last remaining copy of that book. That book was a King James version of the Bible. People understand the power of this book. They have abused it. They have misused it. But those who stand before people and speak from this book or speak about this book yes. will face a stricter yes. judgment That's right. because of the influence this book has over your life. That's why Jesus spoke to the religious leaders much harsher than he did to others. There was an expectancy that those who teach the word be set apart for God. I got to say that again. There is an expectancy on the part of the Lord that those who teach the word be set apart for the Lord. Amen. Teachers of the word are expected to live a life that reflects God's nature and character. The people we teach should see in us the God we teach about. Amen. They should see in us the God that we pray to. He should be reflected in how we live and in what we do. Those who, who, who will not be set apart or who teach the word will be better off not teaching at all. But don't feel sorry for us. Because those who have been called by God have also been graced by God to do what we do. We have no excuse if we fail because God has equipped us with everything we need but if we who teaches fall, how great is that fall? Wow. If we who teaches fall, how great will our judgment be? And the last reason to honor spiritual leaders is spiritual leaders are just servants. We're your servants. That's right. That's right. We're here to serve you. Yes. Amen. Yes. And my serving you does not start up here. It starts back there. Yeah. That's right. It starts out there. That's right. I am just as honored to be able to, to show you a place to sit in the sanctuary as I am to stand here and preach before you. 
Because it's work. And the work that leaders do is not defined by what we do up here. This is a very small part of what we do. If our work does not start out there, what we have up here is a position. Now, I don't want this to discourage anyone from preaching or teaching the word of God if God's called you to do it. I just want you to understand our judgment will be stricter. We will face a stricter judgment. Spiritual leaders are servants. Those set in the church as leaders are set in as servants to the body of Christ. Servants who will one day give account of how they serve. See, we got to give account for a lot of things. How we teach, how we serve, how we equip, how we shape in you the character of God. Hebrews 13, 17 says, obey your spiritual leaders and submit to them, recognizing their authority over you. For they're keeping watch over your souls and continually guarding your spiritual welfare as those who will give an account of their stewardship over you. <laughs> so you want to be a leader in the church, huh? <laughs> if you're called to do it, respond. If you're chosen to do it, respond. But please understand the responsibility that goes with it. I can't live my life like you. Not that you live a bad life. <laughs> but I have to watch everything. I have to watch how I look at my wife in public. How I speak to her in public. And private. And private. <laughs> Thank you, honey. <laughs> She's exactly right. She's calling to my remembrance those things that maybe I don't do too well, right? <laughs> this is my point. And, and we're not, we're not, uh, uh, I mean, we just pastors, very low key pastors of a, of a uh, average sized church. But we can't go anywhere hardly without seeing someone we know. They're like, okay, so who was that? People are watching. When you sit in the church as a leader, you're set apart. Not apart as in this, but apart as in responsibility. That's it. That's it. And expectations. And listen, please hear this. You should expect a lot out of me. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. You should expect a lot out of your leaders. I expect a lot out of Aaron. Out of Josh. Out of our entire pastoral staff. Young men. Who when I, when I think back to when I was their age, I mean, I'm like, oh, my God, my life was a mess. <laughs> but I look at them now and I'm so honored by what I see. Because God set you apart. And, and by being set apart, he has graced your life with an ability that I did not have at your age because at your age, I had not been set apart to the Lord's work. I was still working for the devil. You understand what I, you follow what I'm saying? 
I want you to get this. I'm not saying that, there's, that, that, that we're better or we're greater. None of that. It's the work we do that sets us apart. It's not the position. It's not the title. It's what we do. And if we're not willing to do the work, God's going to hold us accountable for not doing the work. We're to heed the leaders among us who are responsible in discharging their duties in providing spiritual oversight over the church. The obedience commanded in Hebrews 13, 17 means to assent to someone else's directions. That is why God holds us so accountable. The expectation is that you would assent to my directions. And boy, my directions better be right. Because Jesus loves his sheep. You hear me? He loves his sheep. And he want to make sure that his sheep is well cared for. That is why we're going to be held to a stricter judgment. That is why we got to give greater account for what we do. Because Jesus loves you. And when I said yes, I said yes to a responsibility that God's going to hold me accountable to. And that's to love his sheep, care for his sheep, feed his sheep, tend to his sheep, work for his sheep, serve his sheep. We're set amongst among you, not just as leaders, but most importantly, as servants. Submission means to yield to one's contrary opinion in favor of another's. Now, this is not to suggest blind, unquestioning obedience to everything a leader may say. For we're to use discernment yes. and remember, we're to test everything. Right. That's right. Yeah. The most important thing about this point is that Jesus calls us to lead with the heart of a servant. Yeah. Church leaders are not autocratic chiefs who lord it over the congregation, Amen. but they're servants who exercise authority with concern with care, and with great love. And any other type of leadership that's in the church is a leadership that God is not pleased with. Jesus said in Luke 2, uh, 22, 25, and 26, in this world, the kings and great men Lorded over their people, yet they are called friends of the people. But among you, it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank. Want position in the church? You want to be great in the church? And the leader should be like a servant. In this, our Lord redefined the meaning of greatness. He reversed the values of the world. And he said, true greatness in God's kingdom is not measured in terms of position, but in terms of service. Hebrews 13, 7 says, remember the leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the examples of their faith. Remember the leaders who taught you the word of God. 
Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the examples of their faith. Honor those leaders that are set in this church.